Hey guys, um, this is my final review video. It's going to cover chapters six, seven, eight, and nine. Um, so let me just share my iPad and we can get started. I'm recording this in the engineering center. So there may be a little bit of background noise, but I'm hoping it's not too bad. Okay, so let's get started with chapter six. Um, so for chapter six, we can first talk about normal and shearing stresses for incompressible viscous flow. So normal and shearing stresses for incompressible viscous flow. And this is, we're just gonna cover rotation and base concept. So rotation, Okay, so your normal stress, normal, uh, is denoted by sigma x sub x, which is equal to negative pressure plus two times the viscosity. Oops. That should be a partial of velocity with respect to x. And then um, it's similar. It's a similar formulation for your y on y stress and your z on z stress. Similar for y and z. Your shearing stress, uh, which is denoted by tau. We have tau xy, and that's the same as tau yx. I'm not sure if you guys went through the proof for that. You probably did. And that's equal to mu times a partial u, partial y, plus partial v, partial x. Um, Quick overview on the Navier-Stokes equations. So Navier-Stokes equations. And I'll just call these NS for short in a later lecture. Um, I forget which we went over this. I believe it was before the last exam. It was the lecture that Hunter did. So for the x direction, we can write rho times the derivative of the time derivative velocity plus the gradient or is equal to negative partial pressure with respect to x plus rho times gravity in your x direction plus mu gradient squared u. And this is your dilation term. So some simplifications that we undertake now the Stokes equations, simplifications is that we have steady linear flow. So your time derivative all equals zero. We are assuming laminar flow. And then um, There's a way we can simplify the equations, the Navier-Stokes equations, for the case of flow between fixed plates. Um, and then you can check or simplifications. Uh, and I'll, I'll go I'll go over this later. So let's go over some applications of the Navier-Stokes equations. So applications of uh, the Stokes equations. First, we've got laminar flow between fixed plates. So laminar flow between fixed plates. And this would be either pressure or gravity driven. So the way this looks is that we've got our two plates, right? Let's set y equals zero at the very middle of the plate. And then we've got a height h between zero and the top plate and the same height h between zero and the bottom plate. The velocity u is going to be u of y. Uh, u of y defines the velocity profile as you go up and down in y. And we're gonna have gravity pointing in this direction. Uh, just to accentuate what your coordinate system looks like, you have this as the x direction, that's your y, and then this will be z. So if you write out the Navier-Stokes equations in your x direction, 
it'll be something like zero is equal to the negative gradient of pressure with respect to x plus your dilation term. So that'd be mu partial squared u or partial, partial y squared. Um, and this is all you need to solve for you. All you need to solve for you. In your y direction, it'll be somewhat similar because we're saying that zero is equal to the same negative uh, derivative of pressure with respect to y. But in this case, since gravity is acting in the y direction, we're going to need to factor that in. So we have negative rho g, which means that if you solve this out, you're going to get pressure is equal to negative rho g y plus some function of x. Uh, another application would be Couette flow. So Couette flow, which is between moving plates. Uh, in this case, your Navier-Stokes equations don't change. It's just your boundary conditions. So I'll say NS doesn't change, only your boundary conditions. So what we had before with our uh, steady, our fixed plates, we had the velocity at y is equal to positive, positive h is zero because of the no slip boundary condition. We had u at y is equal to negative h, also equals zero because of the bound, because of the no slip boundary condition. But now, if I have, let's let me set this up in the same way as before, where y equals zero is in the middle. This will be y is equal to negative h. This will be y is equal to plus h. And I'll be moving this plate with a velocity v. We have a flow coming in from this side with the velocity profile u. So now, because of the no slip boundary condition, the fluid pin is still going to be pinned to each surface. So the one that's not moving at the bottom. So now, let me just move this over a little bit. So now we have u at y equals negative h is equal to zero. That's the same because the plate isn't moving, but at our top plate, u at y is equal to plus h, that's going to be equal to the velocity of the plate because it's going to be, they're pinned to each other, going to be moving at the same velocity. Um, for the case of Poisson flow, P, I might have mispronounced that, but um, I don't speak Spanish, I don't speak French, so you can't. Yeah. No one can get on my case about that. So this would be in a pipe or a cylinder. Uh, to draw out this diagram, I'll say we've got a pipe with some, I might need to redraw this crap. Okay, so the radius of the pipe, I'll call that big R, and then I'll have some sort of velocity flow. I'll say it looks like that. And this would be, we'll call this V sub Z of R. It's going in this direction. To find our coordinate system this time, R is the radial direction, Z is the axial, axial direction, and then theta, I'll draw it like this, so you can see which way it's going. That's theta. It's going to curl behind. Um, so simplifications we can make in this case, not be Stokes equations, so simplifications. We can still say that our time derivatives are zero, and then it'll be negative creating pressure in the axial direction, so dpdz plus viscosity. And since we're in cylindrical coordinates now, our dilation term is going to look a little different. It'll be one over r partial with respect to r of r times partial of vz with respect to r. Cool. So you can see here in this sketch that I've made, it's a bit of a parabolic profile. Parabolic profile. So what we end up getting is that V of Z is one over four mu times partial P, partial Z, times little r squared, which is your coordinate uh, with respect to your radius. So you're just looking from the center minus big R, which is the radius of the pipe squared, 
which if you can, you can simplify out by taking uh, an R squared term or dividing everything by R squared, we'll get delta P R squared over four mu L. Um, one minus R over with R quantity squared. Cool. Another thing about Poisson flow is that you have Poisson's law, which uh, tells us about the volumetric flow rate. So Poisson's law says that Q is equal to the integral from zero to R, the radius from zero to R of V Z R times two pi R dr. And that's just integrating the velocity profile over the entire area. If you solve that out, you should get pi big R to the fourth over eight mu times delta P over L. Oh, I forgot to define it. L is the length of your pipe. Okay, um, we've got flow between two concentric cylinders as well. So flow between two concentric cylinders. I can't remember if you guys covered that in a homework question or not, but I remember I did. If you come to office hours, I can show you what our old question was like. So let's say we have a big pipe, look like that. We've got a little, little cross sections. And inside this pipe, we have another smaller pipe. So I'll say that we have the velocity V naught, the inner, this radius on the inside of Ri, and the distance between the outer pipe will have the radius of R naught. Um, the main thing to think about here is that you have you have to rethink this in terms of your boundary conditions. So your new boundary conditions. For the no slip condition, we know that at R is equal to R naught. So at, when the flow is right next to the outer pipe, you have your velocity, your axial velocity is zero because that outside pipe is not moving. At your radius is equal to Ri, your axial velocity is going to be the same velocity as the pipe, or the in, internal pipe flowing along. So it'll be Vz is equal to V naught. Um, I would say just in terms of tips for the exam for chapter six content, just make sure every uh, repeating variable is dimensionally homogeneous. Like just, I, I, I would say don't plug in numbers until the final step. Solve through everything algebraically, make sure units make sense, and then you can plug in. Um, Actually, that goes straight into our next topic, which is dimensional analysis. So let's go to chapter seven. C7. That is not correct. Chapter seven, dimensional analysis. Um, oh, so for dimensional analysis, remember that if you're doing things like the Buckingham Pi theorem, uh, the final variable that you're solving for cannot be one of your repeating uh, variables. That's something that I struggle with. You guys are probably good with it though. Yeah. Okay, so let's start out with the Buckingham Pi theorem. Buckingham Pi theorem. So this is the method of repeating, repeating variables. Okay. So remember that K is equal to your number of variables, including your dependent variable. Uh, and then your, the value R is the number of dimensions required. Um, in this case, you can use mass length time or force length time to 
depending on the state of the problem, one of them might be easier. Um, and then the number of pi terms is going to be equal to k minus r. This, if my explanation might not be sufficient, so I would recommend maybe revisiting Professor Schwartz's lecture notes. Okay, so let's go over some common, common dimensions, common dimensionless group and their interpretations. So common dimension. Did I spell it right? Dimensionless terms or groups and their interpretations. If you're going to work with fluids in any sort of aspect later on, you're always you're going to hear about this Reynolds number a bunch. So that's rho VL or rho UL, whatever you want to call your velocity, rho VL over mu, which tells you about the ratio of inertial to your viscous forces. Um, I don't think I remember, I'm pretty sure this is the Euler number, VU is equal to P over rho V squared, which tells you about the ratio of your pressure to your inertia terms. You've got FR, which I forgot what the dude's name was. It's V over v square root of GL, which is equal to the ratio of inertial over your gravitational forces. And then you've got, I think this is, actually, I'm not even going to try and pronounce it. I don't, know, I don't know what it is. I don't know what it's called. You've got rho V squared L over sigma, which tells you about your inertial to your interfacial. Um, in this case, sigma. Sigma is just your surface tension, which is in units of force per length. OK. So one of the main applications of using things like dimensionless groups is for scaling. So to try and um, represent certain phenomena using models before you build actual devices. So let's go over models. You've got something called the similarity requirement, which means that all your independent dimensionless groups must, dimensionless groups must be equal. So all independent dimension, dimensionless groups must be equal. So an example, just uh, in terms of variables, let's say we have viscosity of our model, some velocity in our model, a gamma model, and then some height in the model squared. And then that must be equal to uh, non-model uh, viscosity, velocity, gamma, and height. And from this, you can use this to solve out for some variable in your model. So let's, in this case, let's just go with velocity in terms of ratios of your other variables. So this would be gamma m, a gamma of your model, or gamma times the viscosity or the viscosity of the model, and then h m or h squared times your actual velocity. Um, this is what you do when you want to. This you can use things like this to predict prototype behavior. Okay, so let's talk about non-dimensional governing equations. So most of our, most of the equations that you use for solving problems in fluid mechanics so far, your governing equations can be written into dimensionless terms. So whenever you're doing this, the first thing you're going to have to do is you're going to have to find some sort of reference value. So define reference value. And this will be based on your problem, based on problem. 
you'll be getting some information from Spivy usually that you can use to define your reference values. This could be something like velocity, it could be some pressure, length, um, and then tau, in this case, it doesn't refer to shooting stress, this is your unit of time. From this, you can define your dimensionless values. Dimension. So for example, velocity, you could say u star is equal to u divided by v, where v is your total velocity. Uh, you could say little v star is equal to your little v, which is velocity in y direction, divided by your total velocity, your reference velocity. Um, in terms of length scales, you could do something like x star is equal to your x coordinate divided by your total length, which is referenced in the same thing with y. So y star is equal to y divided by your reference length. And then for pressure, pressure is going to be whatever pressure you're looking at. It should be pressure star divided by reference pressure. And then for time, your dimensionless time, it'll be your whatever your value of time is divided by your reference time. This is going to be a little bit long, but just for the sake of completeness, I'll write out your Navier-Stokes equations in your x and y directions in dimensionless terms. So let's do an S. Okay, so you've got in the x direction, L over tau B times partial U star over partial T star. You can skip through this part if you don't want to see the entire derivation. U star, partial U star over partial X star. I don't really want to write all that out again for the y direction. So I'm just going to duplicate that. And in this case, what we're going to do is we're just going to replace all these little u's, all of those u's, all these u's with v. So this would be v, or it should be little v, little v there. And then there's one more thing. So since in the y direction, usually we factor, we, we conventionally write gravity as being in the y direction. We need to add an extra term factoring in the gravity. So this would be minus GL over V squared. Um, and let me just write out what your dimensionless coefficients are. So all of these terms that I'm underlining right now, these are going to be your dimensionless groups. So you've got that, those. Okay. So right. Underlined terms are dimensionless coefficients. Um, and each of these has a name. So your L over tau B, this is called your Stokes number. You've got reference pressure over rho squared. This is your Euler number, I believe. GL of V squared. This is one over FR squared. And then your last one, mu over rho BL. This is just one, this is the inverse of your Reynolds number. Okay, let's move on to chapter eight. Okay, so this is gonna this is gonna take a couple more diagrams, which I'm gonna need you guys to be a little patient with me. So let's be slow in pipes. So we've got different types of pipe flow. So types of pipe flow. So if I have my big pipe system like this with my flow going to the middle. 
I'm going to stay, I'm going to introduce a stream of dive. Do a little inlet right there. Let me just, man, that's so ugly. It's not a straight line. Okay, good enough. Let me duplicate this out three times. That's one, two, three. The first type of flow is laminar. So that's with your Reynolds number is less than about 2100. In this case, your stream of dye is just going to flow straight like that because all of your flow is going to be in sheets. That's why it's called laminar flow. You're, you're, they're flowing in laminar. You've also got turbulent flow. So this is your Reynolds number is above about 4,000. And in this case, your flow, you're going to introduce your stream of dye and it's going to just go crazy, go everywhere, get all mixed up. And then you've also got transitional flow. So it's where it's starting to move from being laminar to turbulence. You've got, let's just say, and then towards the end, it becomes more turbulent. Um, you've got steady versus non-steady flow. Uh, and that's just going to tell you about the nature of your time derivative. Your flow is transient, changing with time or not. Um, we've got, you could either have entrance region effects or your flow could be fully developed. So I'm going to have to draw a diagram for this. Let's just pretend this is a big tank and it's turning into a, man, that's really ugly. Okay, I have a pipe, that's my tank. My tank is gonna be filled with fluid. And what's gonna happen is that yeah. as we go down, uh, there's something called the inviscid cone. So let's say we start off with some sort of plug flow like that. This is gonna be the inviscid cone. And this is cone. And that is your boundary layer. Cool. So as it goes down the length of the pipe, it's going to go from being plug flow to being laminar flow. So you're going to start off with a flat velocity profile. And then as it goes down, it'll start to get rounded out. It'll still be flat around the inviscid cone. But by the time that it exits the invisible cone, you should have a parabolic velocity profile. And the, and the length that it takes from the entrance to get to this parabolic velocity profile, we call this your entrance length. So this will, this will be the length over which you have entrance region flow. And then past this point, you have fully developed flow. Fully developed flow. And just to define the coordinate system, that's your radial direction and that's your actual. In this case, I'm just going to call that X. So to summarize out what I just talked about, you're in your entrance region. So your velocity profile, your velocity profile evolves from being uniform so your plug like plug flow to being fully developed and when your flow is fully developed your velocity profile will be unchanging oh God. unchanging let me rewrite this the velocity profile is unchanging with this um, So there are a couple numbers. I don't know if I should, I'll talk about it. So if you have your entrance length over your diameter of the pipe with being about like, 0.06 of your Reynolds number, that's indicative of laminar flow. 
if you have your entrance length over your diameter of the pipe about 4.4 times your Reynolds number to the one sixth, that's turbulent. And my numbers might be off because I'm reading off my old notes. So you might want to check that against your notes from class. Um, let's do a force balance. Control volume. Now let's do it. Now let's do this. So steady flow, force steady flow in a cylindrical pipe. Oh man, I need to draw another diagram for this. Okay, so we have big pipe. We'll say that it's, uh, we'll call that diameter big D. So the big diameter pipe, you have a flow coming in, you have lost U, and we're gonna make a control volume that looks like a cylinder. That'll be my control volume. Oh my God, I just cannot draw today. Okay, on our control volume, let's say the pressure on this side is P1, pressure on this side is P2. The length of the control volume we'll call it little l. And then let's call this point at the beginning one, the part at the end point two, and we have shear stresses going this way against it. Um, once again, this is gonna be your radial direction. So it's gonna be your axial C direction. So if you remember from, we just talked about this from chapter six, from section six, your velocity profile, so U, of U sub Z, so the function of R is gonna be delta P big R squared, which is radius of the entire uh, pipe, divided by four mu L um, times one minus little r of R squared. I, and then at the wall, you have your shear stress. The shear stress at the wall is equal to delta P over L of R of Q. Where just for both of these, R is just your big D over Q. So if we use, I don't know what that says. Let's rewrite this, uh, just, in, just to get in terms of diameter, because I feel like that might be a little easier. So rewriting in terms, terms of V instead of R, you'll have your U, the V is going to be equal to delta R. No, this is still going to be, R is just your coordinate, yeah. It will still be U of R. U of R is going to be equal to be delta P and big D squared over sixteen U L and then times one minus R is equal to that's rotated to it'll be two R over D. Squared. I might have done my math wrong there. I don't think I did, but um, I don't know if I have to send a message in the Discord so everyone knows. We could talk about this thing here. It's called your centroid velocity, it's a VC. If you kind of look at what a parabolic profile looks like, this would be something like that. The lot your VC is going to be the maximum velocity at the front of that. Um, the front of your uh, parabolic velocity profile. And to look at if you're looking at it like a profile of the shear stresses, so we'll say that this is your shear stress zero. And then as you get to the wall, 
your shear stresses are increasing. So this would be tau wall. If you remember, our formula for shear stress is that tau is equal to mu times du dr. So you're um, changing your derivative of velocity with respect to your radial direction, which you can plug in radial coordinates. You have two mu bc over r times r over big r. And this is your tau w. Cool. Let's talk about volumetric flow rate. So volumetric flow rate. That's Q is equal to pi R, R to the fourth times delta P, 128 mu L. And then your average velocity, you have, by definition, your volumetric flow rate is equal to your average velocity D bar times the area, which is pi big R squared, which you can expand out, which is pi big R squared bc over two. And from this, if you cancel out the pi r squared, you can see that your v bar is just your centered velocity divided by two. Okay, we've also got the case of laminar flow in a pipe. So if it's horizontal, you can just look at this stuff up here. If it's vertical though, let's say we have a, our pipe actually looks like this now, looks like that. And we have an entrance velocity that looks a little yeah. like crap. It's like that, yeah. parabolic. Our pipe is at some angle theta. And then we're gonna have our control volume looking a little, little something like this at the same angle. So we're gonna set it up in the same way. This will be point one, this will be point two. Got the length of it as little l. Uh, this is r now, that's z. We're defining it not in terms of the base that the pipe is being set on, but the pipe itself, because it'll make our math a little bit easier. And then your shear stresses are against it that way. If you draw a free body diagram on our little element, our little control volume in the middle, You've got pressure one pi r squared, where r is the radius of the little thing. This side is facing the pressure one times pi r squared. That's the forces feeling on that side. We have tau in this direction. Tau is equal to two, or it'll be tau is two pi r l. Uh, and then you've got a weight component. So this would be W rho G times the volume, so pi squared, pi r squared L, which you can break into two components. This will be W cos theta. This will be W sine theta. That's all the forces. Now, if you write out a force balance, you've got your change in pressure between one and two. So delta P pi r squared minus tau times two pi r L minus your gravity weight term, minus rho g sine theta pi r squared l, that's equal to zero. Um, and then what we can do here is we can replace, replace delta p with delta p minus rho g l sine theta, and then substitute that in to this expression here. DC is equal to delta P minus rho GL sine theta, r cubed over four mu L. And this will give you the same parabolic velocity profile. Parabolic D profile. Cool. Um, for the case of turbulent pipe flow, Oh, I don't want to draw a diagram for this. Turbulent pipe flow. Um, we're going to go over the velocity profile and your boundary layer, shape of your boundary layer. Boundary layer. I'm going to compare that to land. 
So for your velocity profile, now since you're in a turbulent regime, you're going to, it, it'll, it'll require you to average. So it requires averaging over fast fluctuations. Um, let's draw our diagram of pipes here. Got one pipe, got a second pipe. So this will be R is equal to big R, so the radius of the pipe. We we'll move this forward. Here. Okay. Um, right next to that is going to be something called your viscous sublayer. The viscous sublayer. Um, and then this would be R is equal to zero, right down the pipe. Velocity profile is going to look a little steeper, closer to that, closer to the viscous sublayer, and then it's going to flatten out here. Um, so we're going to call this region the outer layer, and I'll call this the overlap layer. So you can see that if we draw out our profile again, um, originally, let's say I have some sort of parabolic profile, that's laminar. So this would be laminar. And then as it gets steeper, that's indicative of the Reynolds number increasing. So that's going from laminar flow to turbulent flow. So we're going to say the characteristic that we saw here is that your velocity profile will increase rapidly near the wall. Increase rapidly near wall. And then it's going to chill out. So it'll be much flatter and for laminar flow. So you see here that it's really steep here, then it becomes much flatter as it becomes more and more turbulent. Um, we just talked about the profile is flatter with increasing Reynolds number. And a uh, quick thing to consider is that your boundary layer is like, okay. We can talk about the, let's relate the average velocity of your flow in your pipe to your velocity profile. So average velocity, flow in pipe, being related to your velocity profile. So we have, there's uh, one model called the power law model. The power law model, where your velocity is a function of R, is equal to your centered velocity times one minus R over big R plus one over N. Um, one equation that I have here is that V bar is your centered velocity times 2n squared over n plus 1, 2n plus 1. And then for laminar flow, you have V bar is equal to Vc over 2. And that'll be something like your parabolic, parabolic velocity profile. OK. Um, let's cut that off and start talking about energy considerations. Energy considerations. OK, so we've, from before, we have our mechanical energy equation, which is P1 over gamma plus alpha 1 V1 squared over 2G plus Z1. It's the same for the second side, P2 over gamma plus alpha 2 V squared over 2G plus Z2, and then your losses. So you've got your minor losses, minor losses. And then you've got some major losses. So friction factor L over D, that should be a D, uh, times D squared over 2G. This is going to be major losses. 
Um, and this is going to be equations of energy, this is going to be units of energy over height. So if you have an alpha one, it'll be a uniform velocity profile. If you have an alpha of two, I believe it's parabolic. So if you have a complicated system with pipes, your major losses will occur from viscous effects in the straight sections of that system of pipes. So major losses from viscous effects in straight sections of pipe. So we've got two symbols that we're gonna introduce here. Little e is just gonna be roughness. And then e divided by d is gonna be your relative roughness. Okay, um, f is gonna be your friction factor. And that's equal to 64 over your Reynolds number um, if it's laminar. And then if it's turbulent, it'll be some function phi of your Reynolds number and your relative roughness. And this is if it's turbulent. In this case, you're gonna to have to check out your Moody chart. So check Moody chart. Um, your major losses, so major head losses, HL major. That's gonna be equal to delta your change in pressure over gamma, which is your friction factor F times L over D squared over two G. All right. Um, talking about your Moody chart, so Moody chart, you've got a couple equations that you use with the Moody chart. The Moody chart equations, we've got the Colbert formula. And I believe that's a Holland equation. I might have, I, I can't read my old handwriting. I'm sorry, guys. Um, equation. Um, the other thing that you have to consider in these more complicated sections of pipes is your minor losses. Minor losses. And this will be from your non straight pipe, pipe, pipe couplings. Pipe couplings. I'm sorry, it's been a long day. Okay. So the definition of your KL is that KL is equal to your HL minor V squared divided by 2G. That's equal to your delta P over one half rho V squared. Um, so you can rearrange that to say that your minor losses, HL minor, is equal to KL over V squared over 2B. I believe that's correct. Um, the KL, the value of the KL is going to be some sort of some function of your geometry and the properties of flow, so the Reynolds number. So you can see. Um, I don't remember which week you guys went over it, but you can check lecture notes or book for the KLs of various components based on the shape. Based on shape. Okay. Qualitatively, if you have a larger KL, that means you have more flow disruption, more low disruption. So then we can quantify all this together in something called the overall loss. So your overall loss is going to be your HL. This is some of your major losses, HL major, plus the sum of your HL minor, which is going to be the sum. I'll just call this I. Uh, so this would be for straight elements. 
of the friction factor of each straight element times the length of the straight element over the diameter of the straight element is g i squared over 2g plus and j I'm going to use to represent your non straight elements, so non straight elements. This will be this KL for each component times the velocity for each component squared over 2g. Uh, I think the last thing you guys went over in chapter eight was pipes in series and in parallel. Let's do pipes in series and parallel. Um, this is going to be another diagram. Great. So I've got, let's um, I have a big, I have a medium pipe going to a small pipe going to a super big pipe. I'll call this one pipe one, this will be pipe two, this will be pipe three. Each of our section has a different uh, friction factor, a length and a diameter. So we'll call this F1, L1, D1, F2, L2, D2, and then F3, L3, D3. The thing that we know is that no matter what sort of uh, setup we have for our pipes in parallel, the flow through each section of the pipe has to be the same. So Q1 is gonna be equal to Q2, which is equal to Q3. And then we can turn that into, we can relate that to our velocities and areas. So V1, A1 is equal to V2, A2, which is equal to V3, A3. And where your area of whichever component you're on, I, is pi times um, your diameter of I, di. That should be a D, divided by two squared. Okay. In this, your major head loss, your total major head loss, major head loss is going to be, you're just going to add them up. So HL is equal to HL1 plus HL2 plus HL3. Now, in the other case, if we have pipes in parallel, I need to draw this out. Okay. Let's have a super thin pipe up here. And then let's have a thicker pipe down here. And then an even thicker pipe over there. Okay, thick. So let's call, let's say that the velocity in this pipe is V1, this is V2, V3. We've got the same little diameter. So we've got diameter one, diameter two, diameter two, and diameter three. This would be tank A, let's call it tank B. The flow through one, V1, V2, V3. Great. So in this case, we can say that all the flow rates are equal. Um, obviously, you've got it'll be a lot easier for fluid to flow through that bottom pipe that's bigger than the smaller pipe. So we'll say Q is equal to the total, the total flux Q is equal to the sum of all your fluxes. You've got Q1 plus Q2 plus Q3 plus however many fluxes you get. It's just the sum over all your fluxes. And then your head losses though are gonna be the same. So HL1 is equal to HL2, which is equal to HL3. You can see here that the energy loss between points A and points B, it's independent of path. Independent. Okay, this is the last chapter we're gonna cover. Almost there, guys. Chapter, what oh, chapter are we on? Last one was eight, okay, chapter nine. And this will be on external flow. If you're talking to any of your aerospace friends, this is the stuff that they do. Okay. So we're gonna start from general principles. So general principles means you've got lift and drag. And that comes as a result of the shear stress and the pressure distribution around objects. So pressure distribution around objects. We've got something, so our drag 
which is our fancy D, is equal to our drag coefficient times one half rho u squared a. And then our lift, which is our fancy L, is equal to our lift coefficient times one half rho u squared a. And now the question is, if we're, if we're talking about external flow, our object is probably going to be a little complicated. It'll have multiple faces that you could use. So the question is, which a, which, which, which surfaces area do you use? And you're going to want to use the frontal area. Frontal area. So the one that's going head on into the external flow. So if I have something like, let's say, an aeroflow, like that, I'll have my velocity, my external velocity u coming in. And then around it, it'll look a little like that. So we've got lift right all over here. And then pressure on this side all around. This is where your pressure is going to be greater than zero. And here it's going to feel pressure less than zero. What you've got in this case, you've got some drag in your x direction because it's going to be flying this way against the, it's going to be moving this way against your uh, external velocity. And you've got lift in your y direction because of the pressure differential. The pressure above it is much lower than the pressure below it. And then if you take a look at the profile of the airflow again, then you get better drawing. Um, let me try that again. Not good enough. All of your shear stresses, it, it'll be feeling shear stresses all along its length. Okay. Um, let's talk about streamlined, blunt, streamlined and blunt objects uh, when compared comparing to Reynolds number. Streamlined versus blunt objects versus the Reynolds number. Um, I think there's a diagram. Check lecture notes for diagram. So got the boundary layer. Boundary layer. It'll be laminar or streamlined object and it'll be turbulent at high Reynolds number or blunt object. And you can also take you can also quantify the separation and your wake. Um, last thing we're going to talk about is your boundary layer phenomenon. Boundary layer phenomena. Okay, so for this, I'm going to quickly, let's draw out a little sheet, just like a little plane right here. This will be your y direction, this will be your x direction. And what I'm going to have is I'm going to have a little bit of flow like that. All that built to x. So from your Blas uh, Blasius solution, Blasius, Blasius, I don't know, Blasius, this solution, you can tell that there's a velocity, velocity has some dependence on x. So your delta, your boundary layer thickness is going to be proportional to mu x over velocity of rho one half. Um, this there's another thing called the 99% definition. So we're using the 99% definition. Your delta is going to be approximately equal to five, I believe, times the square root of mu x, mu x over rho u, which is just equal to five x over root. Um, I believe that's everything. So 
I'm gonna stop sharing. It's been a really fun semester seeing you guys. I appreciate seeing some of you guys in office hours. Good luck on your exams. And I'll see you next year and keep masters for you.